The Peter Schiff Show. All right, Stefan Molyneux, back for Peter Schiff. Now, we interrupt your regularly scheduled sophistry with a few facts about the poor. Don't mean to shock you. Still looking forward to your calls, 855-4-SHIFT. But let's talk a little bit about some facts, shall we? So there is a group in America called the poor. And do you know that the lowest one-fifth of households, their income equals the average household income in the early 1970s? In other words, to be poor now is the equivalent of being middle class in the 1970s. Not too poor. Not too bad. 43% of poor households own their own homes. The average home owned by persons classified as poor is a three-bedroom house with one and a half baths, a garage, and a porch or a patio. 80% of poor households have air conditioning. In 1970, only 36% of the entire U.S. population enjoyed air conditioning, and they were all in Phoenix. The average poor American has more living space than the average individual living in Paris or London or Vienna or Athens and other cities throughout Europe. Get that? Average poor American has more living space than the average person as a whole. Three quarters of poor households own a car. 31% own two or more cars. 97% of poor households have a color TV. Over half of them have two or more. 89% own microwave ovens. More than half have a stereo and more than a third have an automatic dishwasher. Ooh, that's poverty. <laughs> Let me introduce you to a little place called the Middle Ages where if you got a toothache, you freaking died. Would you rather be poor in America now or, say, the King of Prussia a hundred years ago? Let me give you a hint. Antibiotics. <laughs> Quite helpful. They ain't undernourished either, the poor. If you've seen any of those middle-of-the-body TV news spots about obesity, average consumption of protein, vitamins, and minerals, virtually the same for both poor and middle-class children. And that's actually quite above recommended norms. Poor children consume more meat than do higher-income children and have average protein intakes 100% above recommended levels. Most poor children today are, in fact, supernourished and grow up to be, on average, one inch taller and 10 pounds heavier than the GIs who stormed the beaches of Normandy in World War II. They weigh the equivalent of 19 Justin Bieber's. Only 2% of the poor say they often do not have enough to eat. Now, in good economic times or bad, whether there's a recession or not, the typical poor family with children is supported by only 800 hours of work during a year. <laughs> that amounts to 16 hours of work per week. The typical poor family with children is supported by one adult working 16 hours per week. Hmm. I wonder if there's a correlation between work and wealth between not working and being poor. Something to mull over. So if one person just went full-time, so if the work in each family were raised to 2,000 hours per year, two parents going part-time or one parent going full-time, almost 75% of poor children would no longer be poor. So no worky, no money. Father absence is another major cause of child poverty in the U.S. Nearly two-thirds of poor children reside in single-parent homes. Each year, an additional 1.5 million children are born out of wedlock. A very central and strong predictor for poverty. So if poor moms, you know, did something as radical as, say, marrying the fathers of their children, almost three quarters of those children would immediately be lifted out of poverty. So work and marriage. How do you get out of poverty? It's a one, two, three, baby. One. Finish high school. Two, get a job and keep it for a year. Three, don't have kids till you're married. That's it. You're in the middle class. Game over for poverty. Not that complicated. Of course, the welfare system doesn't help. The welfare system is hostile to both marriage and work. As I said before, the poor are crops farmed by government programs. They don't destroy their crop base. They don't destroy the source of their income. Major programs like food stamps, public housing, and Medicaid continue to reward idleness and penalize marriage. Ooh, why else are people in America poor? Because they weren't born there. Every year the U.S. imports, through both legal and illegal immigration, hundreds of thousands of additional poor people. Hmm. Keep getting more people, having trouble getting rid of poverty. Plus, of course, the number, the, like the, the standard of poverty just changes. People get richer, they just move the goalpost, right? 
About one in ten of the people counted among the poor by the Census Bureau is either an illegal immigrant or the minor child of an illegal. In the late 1990s, the U.S. did fairly well in reducing child poverty. Successful anti-poverty programs were partially implemented. So they reformed welfare to some small degree in 1996. And what they did was they required some welfare moms to either prepare for work, like get training, or get jobs as a condition of receiving aid. Hmm, as this requirement went out, welfare rolls plummeted, and employment of single mothers increased in a way that had never been achieved before. As the employment of single moms rose, child poverty dropped rapidly. In the quarter century before welfare reform, there was no net change in the poverty rate of children. In single mother families, after this reform in 96 was enacted, the poverty rate dropped from 53.1% in 95 to 39.8% in 2001. Children born and raised outside marriage are 7, 7, 7, 7, 7. You need to hear that number a few times. Seven times more likely to live in poverty than are children born and raised by married couples. Seven times more likely. That is the ring of power. <laughs> Forget about Tolkien. The ring of power is the ring of marriage. It has the power to end poverty, to protect women and children. Uh, abuse in families from men not married to the mother are many times higher, like 30 times higher. Women are the safest in established and, and long-term marriages. Children are the safest in established long-term marriages. The economics of the family is better in established and long-term marriages. You can get mad at me, but you can't get mad at the facts unless you are genuinely and <laughs> generally insane. So, a poverty is not what you think. It's not people living in a box under a bridge. Poverty is, to a large degree, though not entirely, the result of lifestyle choices. You know, a monk who dedicates his life to God is poor. Does he need welfare? No, he's making choices. If you choose not to work, if you choose to have children outside of marriage, and these are choices. I refuse to strip free will from the poor. That would be to hate them entirely. They're human beings just like you and I. There's an old exchange between Hemingway and Fitzgerald. And uh, Fitzgerald said, the rich are different from you and I. And Hemingway said, yeah, they've got more money. <laughs> but it's true. The poor are people just like us, and they make choices, and they get benefits. Wouldn't it be nice to work 16 hours a week? <laughs> Sometimes that would seem really nice. So the poor people make lifestyle choices, have kids outside of wedlock, and they change. This is what happens when the circumstances change, when welfare changes, it changes. You know, in 1960, only 16% of black kids were born outside of wedlock. Now it's almost 75%. What's changed? More racism? No. Welfare state. 855-4-SHIFT. Give us a call, babies. We'll be back right after the break. <laughs> 